Hello, Hebring. I'm here on Facebook. I almost said Instagram, but you're on Facebook. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm so appreciative of this. And as Gerard said, I'm going to be working alongside an amazingly talented lady called Jamie Anderbury. You're going to meet her in a moment. We are here on Second Street in Santa Monica. Uh, the soon to be opened John Paul Mitchell Systems Advanced Academy. And we're just super excited. Before we get any further though, I do want to introduce um, an up and coming model, actress, LA based. This is the lovely Alison. Hello. And um, I'm part way through a haircut here. I'm gonna finish the haircut with you. In a minute, I'm gonna invite Jamie to come in to talk a little bit about the red and black that we put in our hair. And um, yeah, we're gonna see a really cool, cool look. If you will permit me, what I'd like to do is kind of do a little bit of a recap on what have I already done in the interest of time. So I started by dividing a head through here. You can see the dividing section on this side, right through here. So a little bit like a horseshoe shape, guys. Same on both sides. I then took a key section through here. This is really critical that you get this in the right spot. So it's a slightly diagonal section through here. And this divorces the longer back through here, this weight on the mastoid from the shorter sides. Because I'm gonna do a shorter layered side, slightly longer, more heavier graduated back. Once I'd done that, I did a classic, classic technique. So I came through here, I dropped out the hairline and I cut shorter to longer and walked around her head and graduated all of this into this beautiful fullness that you see here on the back of the crown. Can you see that okay, Randy? Yeah. That full profile yeah. shape through there. So built some weight up in there, left these edges out and you can see they're quite raw and broken and soft through there. Jamie's come in and popped some gorgeous color in there that she's gonna talk about later. I then came and layered the sides short to long this way. And we do have a disconnection here. There is a divorce here between the shorter sides. Maybe I could get this for you here, Randy, and you can pick this up. You can see a shorter layer through the underneath with a longer layer on top. So that just gives us a little bit of width in there. And um, I'm gonna come and cut the other side for you in a second. I'm gonna work on that. And then the piece de la resistance is the fringe. We're gonna do two fringes, not one. We're gonna cut a shorter underneath. We're gonna cut a longer top. And that's going to reveal the gorgeous black panel that Jamie's already put into the hair. And I think that's probably a really good transition point to bring in Jamie and have her talk a little bit about not just the color that she used, not just the, the Paul Mitchell color, but also how did she place that color? So ladies and gentlemen, the lovely Jamie. Thank you, what an introduction. <laughs> Thank you, thanks for having us. Thank you, Hairbrain. Thank you, Allison and Steven. Um, it's been an amazing day working with our lovely redhead. I might be a little biased, but I definitely love red. So I, the story um, of our hair color here today was really with the Demi. Um, Allison shared that she wanted something low maintenance and she's been doing a lot of low maintenance upkeep. And we, you guys will see the befores later, but we had quite the transformation with the haircut. So. Stephen cut off a lot of the history there. Um, so what was left was really a fresh canvas. So um, when choosing the right Demi for that low maintenance effect, I wanted to work with something that had no background color. I wanted pure tone because we wanted to still see some pop. So that was number one, why we went to these shades. And number two, I mean, when you look at her beautiful complexion, what suits her eye color and her skin tone, like. If she isn't a natural redhead, she should be, and we're gonna make that happen. So uh, we wanted some beautiful copper tones, and that was something we talked about before. You know, you can go down many roads with red. We can go ruby, we can go cool, or we can go very copper, and we can go bright. 
and tangerine -y. So after Stephen put in majority of our haircut here, um, where there was still some lightness, we used our new 6C, which is a six copper. So no background color, pure copper tone. That's where we see those pops of tangerine. Um, and then uh, Stephen let me know we wanted to work with a black sliver in the front, which as you know, working with redheads sounds like the kiss of death, but we're like, all right, Allison's down. We wanted to see that fun uh, dimension, that fun, um, you know, something interesting. So I took that sliver that you'll see diagramming of and pulled it away from her face. And that's where we popped in our one end. So, you know, low maintenance here, alternating between a six orange red and a six copper. And that's how we have this beautiful color. And Jamie, I don't think as colorists, we always kind of associate red and black together. Right. Yeah. So I'm super excited to see this. Yeah, I really me too. am. It'll be nice, especially as the grow out. You know, we are really excited that not, because this is a commitment, black is a commitment, but as it grows out, you will see this kind of turn into more like flicks or feathers of that black through her end. So it'll be fun and something she can keep. So I'm over directing this forward guys through here. And the idea here is that we send the hair away from the cheekbones. So obviously pulling that forward and cutting at this angle through here, when this hair's dry, it's gonna kind of flip backwards and really pop her cheekbones and give us a few little playful pieces behind the ears in doing so. So Jamie, how about if you wanna share with everybody, um, the actual formulations that you used. Yeah. Um, placement. Okay. Yep. You want to come right over this way, Randy? So, again, simple. <laughs> I like to keep it simple with color formula. I don't like to overcomplicate. And everyone's canvas is usually complicated to start with, so simple is better. Um, Stephen helped me because we have a really unique fringe here. Stephen helped me section out where we wanted that black to place. And then from there, everything else was easy. We went in first in the back with this 6C that we mentioned. This just launched in November. Um, so that's a new fun, bright copper shade. It's very spicy. It's really rich. It's very gingery. Um, through the top into her crown and apex area, because I wanted to see a little dimension with her copper and not just be one note, I alternated with this 6OR, which is kind of just the opposite. You'll get more like pinky tangerine tones from a 6OR versus that like spicy copper tone from a 6C. So I just alternated slices with that until we approached our black sliver. And then, you know, I, I learn a lot from my hair cutting friends. I don't like to cut hair, but I learn from them. So, and, Jamie, yes. These are all Demi? Yes, colors? these are all the Demi. So just right over her natural right color. Right over, yep. And what, what how long will it last? Like typically when you think of Demi, it means it's it's Demi. Yeah, no. So is this something that'll just like gradually fade out from her hair? Yeah, you know, with her hair texture, she's got some porosity. So I think we'll see like four to six weeks with this. Um, and we did do a little color balance before because she has a lot of natural. So, okay, yeah. so is it green and you take some type of white hair and shampoo yeah. yeah. and kind of cleanse the hair? And then is that, you find that makes the demis kind of a little bit more uh, likely to just kind of seep into the hair? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It gives them, you know, healthy hair doesn't always want right. anything it just sits on, on yeah. the surface. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, because it's, it's such a punchy color to think that it's just demi on top of natural color. I thought maybe you had pre-lightened or something, but that makes sense that it had a little bit of like a color wash on yes. it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, even her natural, it, it does pick up on it still. So for those guests that don't want that, you know, color wash or, or color balance, it's you still see a shift. So, and, and even the, the one end, do you think that will completely fade out? Nah, no, not likely. Some, some, yeah. some depth there. Like yeah, I think that'll depth. stay. I think that'll stay. Well, I think, you know, people would be more open to creative dimensional color like this if they knew that it could, you know, easily just gradually fade away. And yeah. it's not like some massive commitment. Oh, You're yeah. going to be growing out this black chunk for the rest of your life. Yeah. And that background color and tone story, I think is a huge part of that. Cause then you can kind of see into the future a little bit of like, how's that going to fade? Right. So our non background color tones, they're, they're going to stay bright. They're going to stay punchy. And like, I'm that story. Like it just fades to like this pastel-y kind of 
but those um, ones with rich brown tans, like that black, that's gonna fade on tone. Excellent. Well, thank you. I'm yeah. sure we'll touch base again on the yeah. color. Steven, it looks like you finished layering that panel on the side and then car kind of carving out the apple of the cheekbone, which is, you know, just such a precision hair cutter thing to do um, to really kind of frame the face so that hair moves around. Uh, it's lovely to see that. And now you've dried that area and uh, pick us up where you are now. So to your point earlier, Gerard, I, I, I just have an, an affection for that pocket. If I can just spin around. I just think on most women, when you open that little pocket there, it's just so flattering on, on most women, really. And I bring it up because I think, you know, a lot of times people, hair cutters are maybe afraid to do that. They think, well, oh, just leave it long and soft. Yeah. But sometimes by carving it, it actually makes it softer and prettier because it pushes the hair around. It does. And, and I think particularly, you know, with that woman who needs a little bit of a lift, we know who that woman is, you know, that needs a little bit of a... A, a lift in our features. Kind I think it strengthens the bone structure. In a way. It, yeah, it pops the brain, uh, brain structure. <laughs> brain structure. Pops that as well. Uh, pops the the facial structure, particularly the eye socket, is where it really, really works. Yeah. So and what I'm going to do now, Gerard, I'm going to pick this up. I've already graduated this. I've established a length. So I'm just going to make this a little bit looser and choppier. And I guess I could do this if I wanted with a razor, but I'm actually gonna do I'd it with like my scissors. That. Come on. You're Have not you gonna see. Uh, these days, Stephen? I did a razor cut this morning, actually. No way. I did. I did it on my legs. <laughs> His legs, yeah. I razored Before my legs. Before you went for a bike race or something. Before I went for a bike ride, Swim yeah. Swim the 100 meters. So what this is doing, I'm taking a little diagonal section here, and if, I'm sure you've got this here, Randy. There's my length that's falling away. There's my graduation. And I just work my scissor tips out. So as I go through this, I push my thumb, Gerard. So as I go through that graduation, I push my thumb and my tips just come out ever so slightly. Let me do that one more so time. So you had graduated in the middle and left the edge disconnected. Totally. So you'd have uh, something to work with when totally. it was dry. Dried it, put in a kind of a perimeter, and now you're connecting, but trying to keep a little bit of long yeah. on the edge. See, and there's my length look, and it's really yeah. broken, and you can see through the haircut mm -hmm. there, which is what I like, rather than it being heavy and solid mm -hmm. down there. So it's and a what, little why, bit more why transparent. Why choose to, to wait till it's dry to do this as opposed to just kind of putting it all wet and, and calling it done? So why do we do this on dry hair? That's a really good question, Gerard, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are asking the same question. The reason I like to do it on dry hair is you get a sense of how's the hairline sitting. Is it sitting flat? Is it going to pop out? Is one side more dense than the other side? It just gives you like a, a sense of where are you heading, really. And um, I just think it's that last sort of 20% of your haircut really shows 80% of the finished result. Mm -hmm. Let me say that one more time. The last 20% of what you do is invariably 80% of what people see. It's that finishing. And I think the finishing's there very often with most, most lengths, most textures after the blow dry. Whether the blow dry is a diffused blow dry, whether it's, it's a dry, a Dry, blow dry with a vent brush or a Denman, but I think that polishing at the end really gets you that sort of, um, that nice sort of finish. And Stephen, to this point, has everything been cut cleanly or what people maybe would call a uh, club cut and now you're starting to kind of work with the tips of the scissors a bit more? In the hairline, yes. Mm -hmm. In here, this is my next step that I want to work with you. Have you got a good angle there, Randy? Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing now is I'm taking a diagonal section that trespasses from the shorter undercut sides and the longer top. So watch me pick up these two. And can you see there's quite a big old lump there? I want length, but I don't want the lump. So right there, look, I'm just going to come into that. And I'm not changing length so much as I'm making it lighter. So would you say that the scissor is kind of parallel with the hair? It is. So it doesn't cut it shorter, like going in on an angle? It you're, is. You're just point, pointing parallel into yeah, the hair. Yeah, right down and into the hair. And I'm cutting more hair here than I am there, if that makes sense too. And it just breaks that up. So we've still got hair hanging over the underneath, but it's not hanging and heavy. 
And, and how do you determine how deeply you want to go in with that? Would that vary from hair density to hair density? Yeah, I think you're right, Gerard. I think, you know, if... if Alison's quite North European, if that makes sense. So she doesn't have a lot of hair. So I'm not going in here too aggressively. Maybe if she was, you know, was a denser Latino Mediterranean type texture, um, I would probably be going in much deeper and maybe a little bit more aggressive. So the thicker the hair, maybe the more length of the blade yeah. you would use, the deeper the parallel point yeah. cutting would be. And again, you could argue you know, that you could do that with thinning shears, and, and I think you probably could. You know, there's a good argument for that, mm -hmm. to be able to do that, you know, so, but yeah. Your, your preference here is to build a strong shape, you know, leave some areas out knowing they're gonna have more detail on them after dry, as opposed to kind of, you know, doing all that wet and drying it and then calling it kind of done. Yeah, my preference for cutting hair really is to build strength. Start with strength, create strength in a haircut, and then if need be, kind of come in and loosen and weaken that strength if that's the, the desired effect. I don't like to start with weakness. I like to start with strength. So speaking of strength, what I'm going to do now is come and work through the fringe. We haven't cut any of Alison's fringe at all at the moment, not at all. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually section a hair parallel to the way that Jamie's um, sectioned her off. So if you come on over here, Randy, one more time, you can clearly see this shape here. So my cutting and sectioning pattern is going to be the same, or a word I love to use when I'm teaching Gerard, parallel. So my first section is through here. And I'm kind of using the color as a guideline, if that makes sense. So there's the black look. Stephen, you've got a lot of your friends uh, viewing from around the world. I want to give some shout outs. Dennis Dettori is here. I just saw a Tony Sadiq. Guys, let us know where you're watching from. We're here in Southern California in Santa Monica at the soon to be Paul Mitchell Advanced Academy and headquarters. It's a space that uh, is in development and we just figured We'd get in here and do something as soon as we possibly could. Let us know where you're watching from so we can give you a shout out. Absolutely. And hi, everybody. Hi, Dennis. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming in and joining us. So I'm pushing that hair into the center. And as I cut that hair, I'm cutting quite bold slots into there, really. And if I can just comb that down and get rid of her mustache, mm -hmm. you can see like little ziggy zaggies. Thank you, Gerard. And because I'm combing into the center, put into in the comments, if you would, if I'm combing hair into the center, please put in the comments, which way is this hair gonna spring? If I'm combing the hair that way, put in the comments, is the hair gonna spring into the center or is it gonna spring towards the back? Is it gonna spring away? I know the answer, away? Stephen, but I'm gonna keep it to myself. You are. <laughs> now, I, I notice you're not cutting it between your fingers. You're putting it right on the skin. What, what, why that uh, approach? <sighs> Good question. So Gerard's question here is, why am I combing this onto the skin? Why am I pressing it onto her forehead? And the answer is something called tension. So when we're cutting hair, there's really only three actions we can use when we're cutting hair. One is elevation. The other one is over direction. And the third one is what I'm using now, which is the one that's probably Gerard. I think it's fair to say the most overlooked and it's called tension. So if I squish this down and hold it quite tight, thank you, Gerard. Watch what happens when I let go now. That very definite, kind of almost like the top of a castle, those turrets. Watch what happens when I let go. You see, it gets all broken and diffused and pretty and soft and shattered. And that just comes really nicely into what I've already cut at the sides. So it just gives us that away movement through here. Now, it's, it's interesting, as I mentioned in the beginning, I've known Stephen for a very long time. I consider him a mentor. I don't think I would have the career I have if it wasn't for his guidance as a young hairdresser. 
and I just had a flashback. Didn't he help you open your first checking account? No, that was Paul. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> but he helped me get the actual job that paid me the checking account. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The check. But no, I remember the first time I had heard toe. We used to call it toe. Yeah. Tank, that was the easy way to remember. T-O-E. Was, yeah, that's why I'm surprised you didn't say I thought you were going to say T-O-A, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you've kind of mixed it up a little bit. No, I, I still teach with toe. <laughs> yes. No, you're absolutely Tension, correct. over direction, and elevation. You know, I, yeah. I was already a Sassoon stylist, but to become a teacher, you go to another level of explanation. Yeah. And I remember one of the first things you, you taught at me was toe. Yeah. And it's an easy one to remember. Gerard, I've been teaching for 40 some years now and I'm a great fan when I'm teaching of teaching with analogies. Mm. I think as hairdressers, if someone tells us something, we don't really get it. Mm. We don't really remember it. But Jesus Christ was one of the best storytellers and Jesus spoke in parables and he spoke in analogies. And I think anytime you can work with an educator who shares things with you in parables and with analogies, it sticks. It really sticks. I think I'm going to learn that one from you too. I'm going to do, do the exactly same thing the same. on the other side. So this time, I'm actually pulling the hair this way. I'm pulling it into the middle. And yes, we did have some responses. Dennis was quick to respond and say that it's going to move the hair back away from the face. Away. Dennis, you're the best, my friend. And would you say, Stephen, that that has something to do with where the short hair is and where the long hair is? Yeah, the shortest hair is in the middle. So anytime, anytime you're pulling hair away from its natural growth, number one, it's always going to spring back to its natural. It's, it's going to do what it wants to do. It's not going to do what we want it to do. It's going to go away from where you're, you're pulling or combing it. Um, the other thing is, is and again, you, you've heard me say this if you've taken one of my classes, short hair is a bully. Short hair is a schoolyard bully. Stephen, what does that mean? It means that short is always going to manipulate and bully and master long. So it's always going to push it around and make it maneuver about. So there we go. And if you look really carefully at that, you can see it's not clean. It's not straight. It's not blunt. It's not clean and it's not straight and it's not blunt for two reasons. Number one is um, I've used tension. Number three, I've over-directed into the center. Uh, number two, I've over-directed into the center. And number three, I'm cutting these zigzags. So that's what really helps it to kind of maneuver across. Thank you, Gerard. There we go. So now I'm going to take this piece down here. We're going to start to see the Jamie Anderbury magic in here, look. So that's kind of hiding that underneath. So what I'm going to do now, Gerard, is take a, a vertical section here and quite simply pick this up. Thank you very, very much, Randy. There's my guideline, and I'm going to slide clean past that guideline, well and truly past that. And then at that point, how do you decide what angle to cut this at? Because there's quite a few different ways you could cut it. Yep. So Gerard's question is a good one. How much, how do I know to cut that way as opposed to that way, as opposed to that way? So basically, if I cut this way, it's going to be much, much more layered and less blunt. If I cut that way, it's going to be incredibly shelfy and ledgy. And is ledgy a word? I'll just make that up. It is a word. It's yeah. a word, ledgy. It is in haircutting. <laughs> so I'm cutting it pretty much vertical. Which, We've all which done is a haircut kind of that's ledgy at some ledgy point. Ledgy at some point or other. Allegedly. Allegedly ledgy. Allegedly ledgy. There you go. Now, if, you, if I comb that down and you come around the front here, Randy, you can see now, look. Look what's peeking Ooh. through. Yeah, the black, the color. The red, yeah. the black, a little bit of the underneath. Trick. So we're, we're playing a little trick on the eye here, guys. We're playing a little trick on the eye. And as I take this next one, I pretty much do the same thing. The difference is now I'm doing what? Put your comments. Tell me what am I doing in the comments? Which way am I pushing this hair here as I cut this second section? What am I doing here, guys, that's different? So, I mean, in a sense, you know, and I, I know many of our viewers have probably done undercutting on other parts of the head, the side and the back. 
this is a similar idea. You've undercut, you've cut shorter, and then you have longer hair over it, and you know, the, the beauty and flexibility it gives in other places in the haircut, it can also do here if you're bold enough to try it. Yeah, I think, in a nutshell, what I've done, Gerard, is two haircuts. I've done a haircut underneath, I've done another haircut on top, but one haircut really spills on top of the other, and there's Jamie's black. That's smoking, isn't it? Absolutely smoking. And you can see, as she said, there's just that little feathered edge. And um, I'm sure watching this, you kind of thought, black? Red? You thought it was going to look really vulgar and bold and loud and a little bit tasteless. But I think with the way it's placed and the amount of black that we've used, combined with the Paul Mitchell demis, it's a very subtle type of finish there, isn't it? Really? Yeah. So put in the comments, what am I doing with these vertical sections? I pull the first section straight out from the head. What am I doing with these other preceding sections as I work around the forehead? What am I doing, guys? Anybody? Over-directing. Yes! Who said that? Uh, it was Dennis again. Dennis, you're he the man. He was supposed to leave for his guitar lessons. You know, he, he yeah. Stuck yeah, I'm pulling that hair away from her cheekbones. Elizabeth Porter also. Hey, Elizabeth Porter. And Arlene says, Stephen is incredibly informative when he teaches. Oh, thanks. I can Stephen. tell you Stephen is incredibly informative no matter what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> we could be having lunch and he would be incredibly informative. I used to work with Arlene in Chicago. She is just a delight. Oh, that's lovely. That's so pretty. In fact, if we were in Texas, we might say that that's Mardi Purdy. <laughs> Mardi Purdy, yeah. Right, this is another thing I remember from the old days, Stephen doing accents, Canadian I know. accents. And because you know, we would have students every week from different parts of the country and the world, and he would endear himself to them by doing their accents. I know. Still do it. I don't know if I ever quite heard you do a Brooklyn one, but you leave that to me. Yeah, I'll leave that with you. You're the man <laughs> for Brooklyn. Yeah, and you've probably noticed already, I am very proud indeed with my comb. And I'm using this comb because, as you well know, the World Cup just started. And the captains of the World Cup were not allowed to wear pride captains' armbands. So I thought I might do this. Using your pride comb. So Using my pride. 339 pride edition comb. Pride edition 339 Wires Park. Is it important to soften that corner there between the side and the, and the fringe? Um, I don't think it's... I don't think it's um, a must do. I just think it makes the hair a little bit more fluid. Um, what I'm afraid of is where the short meets the long. If we're not careful, that can get a little bit lumpy. And you notice where I'm standing, Gerard. I'm standing at the back. By standing at the back, I've then got a natural tendency to pull that hair off of where I want the length. And I want the length in this corner. So a great rule of thumb, really, when we're cutting hair, is a, a, a great rule of thumb is if you want to keep length, if you want to keep weight, if you want to keep volume, stand in the opposite place. I mean, to me, it's all the little things that, you know, that you've done there. I, to me, just beveling that corner through that side took it from a good haircut to a great haircut. Yeah, thank and you. I think sometimes people, you know, kind of miss that or, you know, they, they don't have time for it or focus for it. Where it's back to what you said, that Parathos law, that last 20% is equal to 80% of the result. Yeah, and that's not just cutting hair, is it? That's kind it's of life, life yeah, in it's, general, it's isn't it? Yeah. It's a universal thing with, with life, really. Is. I mean, another one that I always try to live by, and this is kind of hard, obviously, for everybody, and in, in a, certainly in a salon situation at four o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, but... Sometimes when I get in a little bit of a sweat and I start to get, you know, a bit hot under the collar, I try to slow down. And I always remember that amazing 
that amazing saying. Um, and I think this came from Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon Bonaparte said to his valet, a valet, by the way, is not a guy who parks cars. He's a gentleman's gentleman. He said to his valet one morning when he was about to go out and have a huge battle um, and he had to impress his troops, he said to his troops from his horse, from, um, he said to his valet when he was getting dressed, he said, dress me slowly, I'm in a hurry. One more time, dress me slowly, I'm in a hurry. And I think that's really something that I try to to live by with everything that I do is to just sometimes when you get a little bit hot under the collar, you know, just sort of slow down a little bit sometimes. Well, when it comes to hairdressing, I mean, it always takes longer to fix something that wasn't right than to do it right the first time. No, it does. So it's no, I think you're absolutely inevitably right. when you rush, if you if you care, at the end you're fixing a lot of things that didn't turn out right, whether it yeah. be with the color or the haircut, or if you take your time and you know measure it twice you only have to cut it once oh that's a great mm -hmm. got that one from my mom yeah was your mom a carpenter she could have been <laughs> yeah. she, was, she was very accomplished in, in all things that single mothers are accomplished in. mums are great aren't they i'm going to see my mom on saturday you should have gerard take her christmas gifts for you i know yes, that's a classic story can I tell that story? Please, yeah, please do. Yeah. Go ahead, go for it. Yeah, so, you know, as I said, Steve and I have a long history going back probably close to 25, over 25 years. And uh, at one point I was going to England to do some work and he asked me to take a suitcase to his mom that had Christmas presents. It was in the winter and there was some Christmas presents in there. And uh, it was a black suitcase. And uh, when I got to, you know, long flight from LA, I got off the plane, I go to the baggage claim, I take what I think is the right bag get back to the uh, company apartment, open the bag. Uh, actually, I didn't even open it. I noticed that, first of all, I noticed that it wasn't, didn't say Harley Davidson on it, which is what his bag was, a Harley Davidson bag. And then I was like, uh-oh. So I looked at the name tag and it, it definitely wasn't Moody. So I'd taken the wrong bag for his, his mom's Christmas. And uh, I was pretty young and inexperienced. And this is before the internet. And there wasn't, I couldn't just punch something into an app and get a new bag. So. I pretty much sat on the phone with uh, the airline for hours thinking, oh my God, I lost Steven's family's Christmas presents. We'll never get them back. My career's over. But long story Before short, even started. Yeah, 24 hours later, we got the bag and I was able to deliver it. Yeah. And my family got Christmas presents. They got Christmas. Aww. I didn't ruin Christmas after all. Yeah. You saved Christmas. I saved Christmas. With a lot of help from Paul Chattel. The hairdresser who saved Christmas. Yeah, because Paul was actually there at the same time as me, and I was pretty useless without um, him at the time. So he. So I'm drawing to a close here. Maybe what we could do, Randy, if this is okay with you, I would really love to um, go over to the um, to the board and just show everybody the diagram. I took the time to kind of draw this out. Um, my brain works best when I kind of draw things out and I see shape and angles, etc. And um, so if we want to jump over here, um, I started this haircut, Randy. These black lines here are dividing sections. And I think it's important with any haircut that contains a lot of different shapes, angles, undercuts, to divide and conquer. Divide and conquer to begin with. So this section is not vertical. It's to the back of the ear, just in front of the mastoid. So this is angled a little bit diagonal. So that's my first section. I do the same on the other side. I then take like a horseshoe, horseshoe shaped section through here. I divorce the sides from the top. I then take a little band through here to divorce the shorter underneath fringe. And as Gerard pointed out here, I took another section all the way around the hairline. There's the back view of it and just drop the hairline out. Just totally, totally left it out. Once I got the, all, those in place, then I could start cutting hair. And I actually started there, Randy. Diagonal behind the ear. And I cut longer into shorter and I crisscrossed through the middle. Crisscrossed over to the opposite shoulder blade. 
On the other side, I did exactly the same, longer to shorter, crisscrossing through the middle. So I cut the middle twice. At this point, the back's super long. The back is a bob. It's like down to here somewhere. So once the back is finished, I then came on the top, took sections from front to back, pulled the first one straight up, collapsed a little bit over to the sides. So the top's a tiny, tiny bit round. It's not square up there. Then cut the sides, short out to long. You can see it here, Randy, short to long. That leaves the edges nice and soft and pretty. Yeah, and then right here is the part that Gerard was speaking about earlier is where I connected the long, heavy top into the short layered sides. And what I just did was the tension in here and opened up that front. Well, as we begin to uh, to wind up, Stephen, uh, there's a few people here who wanted to give you, say hello, Nick Khan. Hey, Hello, your Nick friend, Khan. Nick Khan. Uh, Mary Lennox. Oh, Mary. Hi. Listen. Elizabeth Porter misses cutting hair with you, Stephen. Oh, well, I'm sure there'll be Elizabeth. plenty of opportunities to do just that and this fantastic facility uh, that's going to be undergoing a major transformation. It's a building right here in Santa Monica on 2nd Street. Uh, right now, Paul Mitchell's using it to do cool content and stuff like that. Well, they get the permits to turn this into a full-fledged academy and some office space. So look for that happening over the next, uh, next few years. I'm sure it's going to be a multi-year project but it's gonna be very exciting. I'm sure Hairbrain will be here a lot. Steven, this looks incredible with what you've done with Allison's hair here. Uh, you've kind of given her an incredible look. So what are you finishing up with there? I'm using a little bit, well, first of all. Because it's not shiny enough. It's not shiny <laughs> enough, yeah. I did start with quick slip. That's what in you there. That's what I blow dried in. That was my foundation, really. So Paul Mitchell quick slip. And uh, I'm just using a little bit of this spray wax. It's one of my all-time favorites. Yeah. Of all the products I've worked with from everything, that's one that I would have in my top five. Isn't it funny how you always come back to your favorites? Mm -hmm. I always try to grab it when I can. Yeah. yeah. Maybe I can walk out of here with a few. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A couple of cans. A few cans. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, it really was a, a very, it's probably been around for over 20 years, but it was the first kind of spray wax, as the name implies. And, body can. Yes. <laughs> and I remember just at the time I owned a salon and we had Paul Mitchell in the salon and we couldn't keep it in stock because once I started using it on people, they were like, what is that? It changes the hair. It's a wax in a spray form. Yeah. But you, you were speaking about shine earlier. I think the foundation for any shine on any hair is color. And, um, you know, I, I, I big shout out to Jamie, because I think, um, you know, the way that she's worked with the Demi here to get this really lovely glossy sort of finish to the hair is, is gorgeous. And I love how the, the, um, the red and the blacks kind of all married together. And I, I also think it's fantastic how the blacks subtle. And we don't necessarily associate the word black in hair, subtle. Subtle. we're subtle, the two don't go together, but I think she's really nailed 